it was a rough and raw era back then, and you got away with a lot more. Boxing is a tough way to make a living. I mean, somebody hitting you in the face, this is how you get paid. His hard scrabble beginnings added to this reputation as a working class hero, as a guy who would come from nothing, from worse than nothing. Jack Dempsey had a reputation for being ruthless in the ring. When he hit you, it brought blood. When you're fighting and you have nothing to lose, it makes you pretty dangerous. Greatness can come from very rough and humble beginnings in a place like Colorado. He pulled himself up by the bootstraps out of nothing and became a prize fighter because that's all he wanted to do. That was his dream from a very young age. He was an American original. Experiences made in partnership with History Colorado. Inspiring generations to find wonder and meaning in our past and to engage in creating a better Colorado. HistoryColorado.org. With funding provided by the University of Denver, celebrating 150 years. The Denver Public Library. The Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. again and rules on the floor for a second time. The champion looks hurt. He's dazed, but will jump again. Dempsey's Jack hit. got the name of Manasseh Muller from Damon Runyon. Jack was very brutal in the ring, and Damon Runyon, of course, was such a famous author that I'm sure that he loved the alliteration of, of Manasseh Muller, and it just stuck. Jack Dempsey's family, that's Hiram Dempsey and his mother, Celia Dempsey, they were from West Virginia. And during a period of the late 1800s, a lot of Mormons, and they were a Mormon family, were moving from the south of the United States out west. Uh, better opportunities, uh, closer to Utah, where the Mormon population was very strong. They ended up in Manasseh after Hiram had met a Mormon missionary. He liked what he heard, and he and his wife joined the faith, and they moved west with Mormon settlers. And that's how they came to be in Manasseh. I don't know if this was their destination or if supplies had run out and they were just stuck, but we're happy they ended up here. Jack's father was not the best Mormon. He, he smoked, he, he drank, he was known to use profanity. He was a little averse to work. He always had a big get-rich-quick scheme, but very few of them ever petered out. Jack's mother was salt of the earth. She was a very hard worker. She was dedicated to her family and was willing to do manual labor, hard physical labor, run bed and breakfasts, uh, do everything that she could to see that the ends met for her family. They were very, very poor and many times had not enough food to eat. The church would see that maybe the cupboards were a little sparse and kids were without shoes or whatever and so without anything being said they would leave and within the next day or so there would be groceries bought to the home and any need was met. That's how the Dempseys survived, as probably how several families in Manassas survived. Legend has it that Jack's mother took in a hobo, and she didn't have much, but she offered him what she had, which was a place by her fire and a hot meal. And in return for that, the hobo said, you can take anything you want out of my pack. And she was pregnant with Jack at the time and something made her choose a biography of John L. Sullivan. John L. Sullivan, the Boston strong boy, the bare knuckle champion of America, a great hero for all Americans. She read it and told the midwife when, uh, when Jack was born, I want my son to be a heavyweight champion too. And uh, which is an odd thing for a mother to say, to go and I want my son to be a boxer, but it, she so admired this John L. Sullivan that she hoped her son, William Harrison, 
uh, Dempsey would, would be like that, a champion. And that, of course, is what he became. William Harrison was born June 24th, 1895, here in Manassa in this little house. And he was the ninth of 11, so the kids had sticks and rocks and each other, and they swam in canals and rivers and played baseball and boxed. Boxing is, is what there was to do, and I think kids did it to see who, who was stronger. Jack was this kid called Willie the Sissy. He was small, and small kids get picked on. The kids here in Manassa used to tease Jack because he had a sissy voice. It was high and squeaky, and nobody ever took him seriously because he talked like a girl, sounded like a girl. So that just gave him all the more reason to toughen up and, and show him that he wasn't a sissy by any stretch and that he could take him. not content to stay in one place for long. Hiram was always looking for something better, a better job where he maybe he didn't have to work too hard. He had this sort of wanderlust with the family, which wasn't very fair to do, taking them in a wagon. They bounced around to basically every mining community you can think of in southern Utah and Colorado. They got kicked out of a town in Colorado and in, in Delta. The people in there, they took one look at the Dempseys and their rags and everything, and the father couldn't get a job, and uh, they told him, you know, we're not going to support you. You're going to have to go. He and his mother and sister were traveling by train to Denver, and his mother only had enough money for a ticket for herself and, and a half fare for the sibling. When the conductor came through to get the tickets, she only produced the, the ticket for her and the smaller child. And the conductor looked at Jack and says he looked him up and down and he said, I was never more aware of our poverty than I was at that moment when he was looking at my ragged shoes and ragged jeans. And he said, when I come back, boy, you better have a ticket or I'm putting you off the train. And he said he could feel the tears at the back of his eyes. Um, he was so scared. What would, what would he do if they put him off the train? A well-dressed gentleman was sitting across the aisle on the train and had taken all of this in and he told Jack, he said, don't worry about it, boy. I don't suppose he'll come back, but if he does, I'll buy your ticket. And he said he never forgot the kindness of that stranger and how much that meant to him. I think it's things like that that happened to him as a boy that kept him humble and approachable throughout his life. They headed north, uh, ultimately to Montrose. That's where Jack really started to become a fighter. When the family came here in, in 1908, Jack's mother started a uh, restaurant called the Rio Grande Eating House. And um, they liked that name and they christened it with uh, a bottle of hard cider. The Dempsey kids did everything they could to help supplement their family income. They, they worked in their mother's restaurant and their boarding houses, but they also sold papers. They, they did anything that they could do in order to make a, a few cents to bring home. Jack Dempsey's older brothers had both been uh, professional fighters of, of some local reputation, uh, nothing big, but, but Dempsey adored his brothers and they, they began teaching him the fundamentals. Bernie, or Burn, would periodically come to where the family was. He had moved on, he was trying to make it as a prize fighter. He'd give Jack lessons, taught him how to do various things, bob and weave and uh, get away from punches and uh, that sort of thing, and uh, made him strong how to jump rope and uh, all those things, and Jack was wanted it all. He had Dempsey soak his hands in beef brine to toughen them up and rub that beef brine on his face to make his face thicker and stronger. And he encouraged Jack Dempsey to chew on pine gum, which Dempsey claimed tasted worse than death, but he continued to do it to toughen up his jaw. And his brother Byrne would also flash a broom handle around. He would waggle it back and forth and, and demand that Dempsey hit the end of the handle. Now the broom was moving lightning fast, but Dempsey in time learned that he could touch the end of it no matter where it went. Uh, so he learned quickness, he learned speed, he certainly learned endurance from his brother Byrne. And he fought the, the neighbor boy, uh, Fred Woods, and he was uh, friends with the carriage worker, uh, William Deal's son, Charlie. They were all good friends and everything like that. The carriage works, they had cleats nailed to the tuba fours in the wall and a hole up in the ceiling 
to, to go up into the upstairs. So they put a ring upstairs, and so Jack and Fred and Charlie Deal, they all would spar with various people in town. And Fred Woods, a block away at the, at the livery stable, had a shed out back, and they put a four foot high ceiling in it. So you had to get down below like this, to below four feet to practice. Think what that does to your, your legs and your, your back, it strengthens them. All of the guys that Jack sparred with, Fred Woods, Charlie Deal, Bernie, his brother, they all gave him tips. But you know, it was Jack that really had the desire to maybe make a profession out of it by this time. And so he worked harder than any of the others, but they all encouraged him as well. In 1909, Jack is about 14, the family decides to move to Provo, Utah, and uh, they go there for two years. He graduates from the eighth grade there. At that time, it was a big deal because a lot of kids weren't going to school. So after two years in Provo, Jack came back to Montrose where he'd had some success. Jack Dempsey was so ambitious. He knew as a teenager that he was going to become a professional boxer. And he went about promoting himself for his first professional fight, which took place in Montrose. And uh, he had it with Fred Woods in the Moose Lodge, upstairs above the Penny's building in 1912. Jack Dempsey and his, his partner organized the fight and they promoted it. And they even had to build the ring. They rented a space and they arranged all the chairs and, and they threw sand on the floor and put ropes around it for the ring. Fred knocks down Jack, but Jack gets back up and, and knocks down uh, Fred, uh, Fred Wood and, and wins the fight. So he, he was in a fight and uh, boom, he won. And when the fight was over, they had to clean it all up again as well. Only a handful of curiosity seekers turned out. Certainly wouldn't be like the huge fights in Madison Square Garden that he would be having only a decade later. After he fought with Fred Woods, he would hop the train, probably illegally. And most of the time, Jack would grab a hold of the brake beam between cars and hang on that for hours. It's just scary. I mean, one little slip and you're, you're, you're done. And he'd ride up to Telluride and go in the bars up there. There weren't any bars in Montrose. He'd go up there and uh, challenge people in the bars. Jack Dempsey's early career is really a career of following the mining circuit from boom to boom to boom. He visited and, and fought and worked in all of the major mining regions of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. He really represented that expansion and opportunism of people who are looking for the next big thing in Colorado. Dempsey was only 16 years old. He weighed 130 pounds. He had this squeaky, girlish voice, but he would march into these saloons and say, I'll fight anybody in here for a dollar. He said, I can't dance, I can't sing, but I can lick anybody in the house. A lot of boxers did that in those days. They, you know, they had to take what was there, and especially when you were starting out. And like today, it's all organized at every level. Uh, back then, you know, he'd go to a town and have to scrounge around and find a fight. He was usually fighting for uh, whatever the, the spectators would donate at the end of the fight, and so sometimes he ended up getting very little. Sometimes he would arrange winner-take-all matches, and he didn't always win. Jack Dempsey's talent came out of desperation. He was hungry. He was literally hungry. He was fighting to put food on his own table. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't practice any vice which he felt would hold him back as a boxer and an athlete. But it was a matter of necessity to win or starve. In these mining towns, he was fighting toughs, miners, rough individuals, mule skinners, cowboys, uh, big bruising men who outweighed him by tens of pounds, who knew a thing or two about boxing as well. Jack Dempsey's edge was he was fast. He had a murderous left hook. And when he wasn't boxing, he would take jobs which made him even stronger. Jobs as a miner or a mule skinner. He worked as a single jacker in a mine, taking a five pound hammer and hitting a metal drill into the face of the rock, wrestling the ore and the mineral out of the rock face itself. The mining built up his shoulders and it built up his hands 
and it made him strong and as hard as the granite and the rock. When you came at Jack, you were coming at the mountain. He stayed in Telluride for, for some time, and then on his own, he took off, and he wound up in Cripple Creek. Byrne had been there, and then showed up again. Bernie was quite a bit older than Jack, probably close to 20 years older. Bernie Dempsey boxed under the name of Jack Dempsey after the famous Irish boxer, Jack Dempsey. And he happened to have a fight coming up that he knew he probably couldn't win. And his younger brother, uh, William, or Jack as we know him, or at the time was boxing under the name of Kid Blackie. And Bernie knew that he could probably take this guy. So Bernie sent word for Kid Blackie to come and take his place at that particular fight. Kid Blackie won that fight. At that point, Bernie Dempsey retired, and Kid Blackie started boxing under the name of Jack Dempsey. For his first fight as Jack Dempsey, he did not get to keep the money because they had substituted fighters and switched out Bernie for, for William Harrison. Prize fighting was very popular, but it, it, it was kind of disreputable. It, had a, a long and distinguished pedigree, but in a lot of places, the kind of boxing that Jack Dempsey did in, in the mining camps was, was certainly illegal. He, in fact, would ha very often have to fight in one town and then immediately leave a step ahead of the sheriff and go to the next town uh, to avoid arrest. It made it very hard for him to break into the more respectable ranks of organized boxing. He wanted to see if he could make it in New York City because that's where the boxing center of the world was at that time anyway. Jack went to New York in 1916 to try to establish himself, but quickly learned that that was probably harder than he thought. Jack's first trip to New York was an unqualified failure. He did not do well. He tried to establish himself, tried to get a name for himself, went around and introduced himself to newspaper writers, to sports writers, to you know the general public. He was sleeping on benches at the time. He didn't have enough money for hotels. He was basically doing everything he could to make a name for himself, and nobody was listening. He got a manager there, and the manager was not good. He put him in terrible fights with, with people much better than him and he just had a bad, bad time. I think he was probably depressed. He had to have been. He goes to New York and he gets turned down or he gets beaten and he, he just says, this isn't a place for me right now. Jack came back from New York when his little brother Bruce was stabbed to death um, in sort of a freak accident. Jack came back to sort of regroup, decide if he was really going to make it as a boxer sort of decide what he was going to do. And he landed in Salida, Colorado. And he gets a job in a body house run by a woman named Laura Evans. And I think Jack had a thing for her. I really do. I think he, I think he really liked her. A fellow in town put together a prize fight for Jack Dempsey. And Jack Dempsey was going to box uh, a, a fellow named Young Hector. Hector's doing most of, mostly running away from Jack Dempsey in the ring because he knows Dempsey's a little more talented. He can see that. And, and Dempsey suddenly turns to Laura Evans, who is sitting ringside, and says, when do you want me to, to knock this guy into your lap? And uh, Laura Evans yawns and said, you know, kind of like, well, whenever you want. And uh, so the next time he comes close to young Hector, Jack Dempsey, knocks him out of the ring and right next to Laura Evans' seat in, in at ringside. It was a nice fight for Jack Dempsey to win, but he also realized from that fight, look, I'm only fighting guys who can't really do anything. In other words, in the Rocky Mountains, there's just not a lot of competition for me. He realized that his talents were too big for Colorado and that he needed a larger stage. He needed more experienced opponents in order to build up that reputation. So he moved to California and it was there the story of Jack Dempsey, the great heavyweight champion, really began. 
and in Los Angeles, he's training at a gym and he meets a, a manager named Jack Kearns. And Jack Kearns starts is training him and gets him better and also gets him some good fights from there on in. Jack's Colorado years, I think, were the basis for his his strength. He relied on the poverty, seeing his parents struggle, seeing his family members struggle, made him into the fighter that he was. He had a big well to draw on. When you're fighting and you have nothing to lose, it makes you pretty dangerous. Dempsey was the latest in a line of sensational boxing superstars. Uh, he'd been preceded by Jack Johnson, John L. Sullivan, fighters all the way back into the 18th century, into the 1700s. And Champion after champion had stepped forward into the spotlight, into the adulation, and by the 1919, it was Dempsey's turn. Brings Willard and Dempsey to the center of the right July 4th, 1919, the, the championship the fight where he fought Jess Willard. When they entered the ring, the crowd laughed because of the size difference. It was like David and Goliath. Dempsey stood six foot 185, and Jess Willard was six seven, 250 pounds. Willard had never been knocked down in his career. Willard was a heavy favorite going into the fight. He was taller than Dempsey. He had a much longer reach, but Dempsey delivered a savage beating to the world heavyweight champion. Dempsey is out of the when he got in the ring, he turned into an entirely different animal. He was ferocious. He would attack and attack and attack. Somebody said about Jack Dempsey, he doesn't have a defense. His defense is to punch. Dempsey berated him with right and left, and there's that left again. How can the champion stand this hard bottom of attack? And he broke his jaw, he broke his nose, he, he caved in his, his cheekbones, he, he, he hit him so hard in the ear, and he never had hearing out of that ear again. He literally destroyed him. And America were fascinated with this guy because he was unlike anything. He was like a wild animal, a savage animal. An unusual and unexpected outcome. Jack Dempsey, the young kid from Manassas, Colorado, defeats world heavyweight. Jack Dempsey became known to America after beating Jess Willard. And his dream had come true. He was one of the most celebrated sports figures in an era of incredibly celebrated sports figures. Babe Ruth, Red Grange, Jack Dempsey. He was up in the firmament of athletic heroes in the United States in the age of ballyhood. He started defending that title fight, not a lot of times, because he was smart. Don't have, don't take three and four fights a year like he used to do when he was training, but take one every few years and uh, space it out and uh, stay in shape. In 1926, he took on Gene Tunney, a challenger who was educated, had been in the military. He was a very skilled technician. Gene Tunney won on a unanimous decision, and America couldn't believe it. Here was a savage animal who could beat anybody. There was nothing he wasn't capable of doing in the boxing ring. And after the fight, Dempsey's wife came up to him and said, I'm sorry, what happened? You know, he'd lost, he'd lost his title that he dreamed for years of having. And Jack Dempsey smiles and says, I forgot to duck. <laughs> and America loved reading that in the newspapers. And so they fought again in 1927. That went down in the record books as the Battle of the Long Count. And Dempsey downed Tunney, but wouldn't go to a neutral corner right away. And so the ref didn't start the count until Dempsey went to his neutral corner. So film footage shows it's a 14 count. And um, I feel like Dempsey should have won. But of course, we know that Dempsey lost the fight. It was also a decision fight. Um, and Dempsey never got the title back. In his defeat, Dempsey said he just fought the smarter fight. And I think it was, once again, his attitude, or maybe humility, for lack of a better word, that kept him popular with people. Jack Dempsey lost the World Heavyweight Championship to Gene Tunney in 1926, but he remained an important fixture in the cultural scene of New York City. He opened his own restaurant, Jack Dempsey's, which became a spot to see and be seen with all of 
New York's sporting and, and, and business and political elite. The restaurant, you know, was his way of thanking America because he would stand by the door and greet everybody. Dempsey was like that. That was a side of, that America really didn't know because he would help people in need. You know, he would always give them money. Even when they came into his restaurant, they'd say to him, you know, I'm from so-and-so in Colorado. And, uh, you know, Dempsey didn't know them and uh, he, he'd let them eat free. And that's the kind of guy he was. He was a good person. And I think he learned that from his mother. It's amazing to me the people that, you know, Dempsey cleaned their clocks, but they remained lifelong friends. Jess Willard, the, the man that he beat for the championship, he was kind of down on his luck. He's a farmer out of Kansas and was going through some hard times, and Dempsey helped him get on his feet, too. And I think that says a lot about them, you know, and their characters. And a lot of people didn't know where this came from. You know, they heard he grew up in Colorado, but they didn't know much else. Jack said to Damon Runyon, who was being interviewed one time, don't tell people I was a hobo, because he was afraid, you know, that the people might get the wrong idea. And, and Runyon said, Jack, you, you are a survivor, you know, that's what you did to survive. That's part of who you are. He had to scramble for everything he had in his early life here, but that translated into such a magnificent legacy as a, one of the great sporting heroes of America. He's got such a character to him, and you know that he's been through it and back, and he could have easily been bitter and been heartbroken and, and been a different person from his experiences, and he chose to take those and use them for good, turn them into something and, and do something great with his life and, and kept a positive attitude. I think a lot of people could relate to him and uh, were kind of in his corner because maybe he reminded them of themselves a little bit and what they wanted. He found himself on the American frontier. That was Colorado, that's where he was born, that's where he grew up, that's where he became a man. I think Jack Dempsey told people by what he did that you can get hit by punches, they may not always come from a boxing glove, you can get back up again and continue your life. And this is what he learned, he got up. Jack Dempsey was summed up best by what was written on his tombstone. He was a gentleman and a gentleman. He was known for his violence in the ring, but outside was, was the exact opposite of that. His role in Manassas is sort of our claim to fame. It's what puts us on the map. And kids today around here still look up to him. They will come in and are inspired by him and his story and what he did for boxing. I've had a lot of them come in that are quite knowledgeable about him and have asked, hey, do you think that I can make it? And I always tell them, if Jack can, anybody can. Thank you.